Welcome back, guys, to episode 51 of the JPS podcast. And in this episode, I'm honored to have Menno Henselman on the show to discuss all things advanced hypertrophy. So for those of you who don't know, Menno is a coach, he's a researcher, and he's one very, very intelligent dude and somebody I highly respect in the industry. And in today's episode, we discuss how to approach training for hypertrophy for advanced athletes looking to maximize muscle growth. We discuss what qualifies somebody to be considered advanced and the measurements and ways we can assess somebody's level of advancement. We also discuss the expected rate of gain for advanced lifters and the mechanisms that lead to a slowdown in progress. We also chat about nutrition and whether or not advanced athletes are better served eating at maintenance a small surplus or a large surplus and how long they should be in a gaining phase uh, for muscle growth. We also chat about periodization and some of Menno's thoughts surrounding that for advanced athletes and discuss high frequency training, uh, the potential benefits of that, whether or not low volume, uh, high intensity phases such as maintenance phases and resensitization is indeed beneficial uh, from a physiological standpoint for advanced athletes. And we discussed the recent Brad Schoenfeld paper that found 45 sets per week led to a significant increase in muscle growth. So thank you for coming on, Menno. And guys, Pleasure. today we are going to be talking about advanced hypertrophy and also discussing the recent publication that came out, uh, the 45 set study by Brad Schoenfeld. So firstly, Menno, uh, I want to discuss advanced hypertrophy and how athletes looking to maximize muscle growth, once they've started to reach their genetic ceiling and potential, should be approaching things. But I thought we, we should first really strip this conversation back and discuss what qualifies a trainee to be considered advanced because we know that a lot of lifters often have a tendency to overestimate their abilities. If they've been lifting for 10 years, they say, yeah, man, I'm advanced. And you're watching them squat and they're barely squatting one and a half times body weight for reps or they're still throwing their curls around and it just looks pretty messy or they're following mm -hmm. a, bro, a bro split, things like this. So I guess what is you know the best way to define somebody who's advanced and then we can start the conversation from there. Sure. What I do is um, I define training advancement depending on the goal as relative development um, in terms of your genetic potential. So if we're talking bodybuilding, which is, is different from the development in terms of how strong you are as a powerlifter, basically, it would be how relatively developed is this muscle group um, compared to what it could be. So basically, I use standards like, yeah, so fat free mass index, the work by Casey Butt, you, based on those, you can get an estimate of how developed each muscle group can become. And then you basically see like, how full is the glass? Um, if this is like the 100% the of the likely potential, if they're like here, then they're very advanced. If they're like here, then they're, they're almost untrained. And somewhere in the middle, you get more and more advanced. So if someone has like a fat-free mass index of 25 and they have normal genetics, then they are almost certainly advanced. If they have like a fat-free mass index of 19, then they are very, very novice. So you do have to relate this to indications of genetic potential. Uh, if you have like a huge frame, frame size is a strong determinant of genetic potential and they have a fat free mass index of 23, 22, then they might still not be advanced, even though if they're like the traditional hard gainer, super slim build, very tiny wrists, tiny ankles, then it's likely that at the fat free mass index of 22, they're already pretty advanced, especially if they're also lean, because um, many people think, uh, although, and then they are advanced, but they have, just have a long way to go in terms of cutting. Because if you have fat free mass index of 25, it doesn't mean, um, and, and you're like obese, then it doesn't mean you retain all of that when you get six pack lean. Um, in terms of strength, you basically do the same, but in terms of uh, development of that lift. So just like muscle growth is muscle specific, strength is very exercise specific. Mm -hmm. So you can be advanced in the bench press if you're like, you've been basically lifting like a bro for the last five years. And you've been doing lots and lots of bench pressing, but you never really learned to squat. You can be advanced in the bench press and still a novice in the squat. Mm -hmm. Usually, though, I mean, if people have been training somewhat intelligently for a couple of years at least, then these things tend to even out because the, if you are a novice in the squat, but you're advanced in the bench press, your squat will go up really fast. And your bench press is going to crawl 
along. So these things tend to even out a lot. And in practice, you can sort of talk about an advanced individual in general, which means like most of their muscle group, or muscle groups or lifts would be at the advanced level. Yeah, so I think awesome. that's the way to go in terms of uh, sort of objectively defining training advancement. Yeah, fantastic. And it seems like uh, objectively defining somebody's level of advancement is is quite multifaceted. There are a number of variables uh, at play here, and obviously, looking to the fast free mass index, you know, this calculator certainly has a number of limitations uh, to it. Do you want to maybe discuss what some of those are, and you know, how mm -hmm. we can better gauge this metric to assess, you know, where we're at in terms of filling up that glass? Mm -hmm. Sure. I use um um, basically, a calculator that I made myself, which includes fat free mass index, but also the calculations from uh, Casey Butt's work, and adjust those also for women. Mm -hmm. And then you, you can see, um, because Casey Butt's work is only dependent on um, desired body fat level, current body fat level, and frame size, pretty much. So it doesn't uh, have anything with the fat free mass index. Um, so it's, it's an additional guideline, basically. Fat free mass index is. Um, it's a useful standard, but it's, it's very rough in that it's, uh, for one, it's just fat-free mass. It doesn't really dis discriminate between muscle mass, even bone density and the like, and other types of lean mass. So someone might intuit or already have quite a lot of lean mass naturally, and it doesn't mean their muscles are actually all that big. And uh, it's also based, the research we have on it is, is pretty limited. It's very strongly influenced by uh, height and body fat percentage, so you have to correct for those, uh, which basically calculates the normalized fat-free mass index, as it's called, which is quite a lot better, uh, especially in terms of um, correcting for uh, height with very tall and very uh, short individuals. Uh, but then I think fat-free mass index is a, it's a useful approximation. I mean, these things are never deterministic, so it's never like your fat-free mass index, which is the common saying, it can never go below above 25. It's like it's a computer yeah. program, and 25 <laughs> is just the, uh, the asymptotic max. Uh, it doesn't work like that. It's like it's an average estimate. So it's mm -hmm. probably like a natural distribution, normal distribution as it's called in statistics, around that level where some people will certainly go above it and very uh, to the point of that paper, which is based on a very old paper that sort of said 25 is the max for natural trainees. You have 20 individuals or something in that paper that have a fat free mass index higher than 25. And those were from the, the pre-steroid era. Okay. So it, the paper by itself already says, you know, it's unlikely that a lot of people will go above 25. But the paper itself already shows a lot of people have actually gone pretty definitively without steroids above 25. And that was with some pretty sub uh, standard training protocols. I'm sure they didn't have the mm -hmm. uh, knowledge or even just the technology available that we do now, which you know could play a huge role in somebody's ability to max out their genetic potential. And I guess what's interesting about the fat-free mass index uh, is that it, it looks at the body as a whole. And like we said, you know some muscle groups may be really, really well developed and really advanced, but some might not be. So it, it can have limitations there also, and I think that's really important to consider. So, how does somebody uh, understand that? You know, if, if their fat-free mass index shows that they're, they're nowhere near their genetic ceiling or they're way below 25, but you know they've got an absolutely massive chest, they're bench pressing, you know, two to three times their body weight. Um, you know, how do they use that to understand what muscle groups are advanced and what are, which muscle groups are not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, strength is a useful uh, proxy as well. I mean, in terms of if you see in the, uh, it's, it's quite unlikely you'll, you'll get an individual that has like a massive chest and you, you won't see it in the chest curve because the Casey butt form calculator uh, actually calculates that as well. Um, chest, shoulders, all, pretty much all measurements. Mm -hmm. um, so you should see it in there um, with those calculations and not just not in the fat free mass index necessarily. Um, like you said, fat free mass index is, is at the whole body level. If, if someone had a low fat-free mass index but a huge chest, it would strongly suggest their legs are underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So exactly. probably That's that would be... At, yeah. yeah, exactly. So that would probably be the, the scenario. And in practice, if you you know you don't want to do a calculations and stuff, you can also use strength standards. EXRX is a good website. Mm -hmm. There's very good ones. Compiled them by Ripito Kilgore and uh, some other guy that contributed and never got credit. <laughs> um, Ripito get, gets all the credit. He gets all the fame and glory. Yeah. <laughs> But, but they're really good. I think I like those standards. They're very realistic. Um, so if you see someone that benches double body weight, then for sure 
it's, it's almost guaranteed that the triceps, delts, and pecs are going to be at the advanced level. Awesome, awesome. So now understanding how we can s- sort of determine where we're at in our lifting career, what is the expected rate of gain or rate of progression that somebody who's at the advanced level can expect to see? Because obviously these estimations are a good starting point to give people an idea, but it can also place a bit of a limitation in our own minds because if we have a fat free mass index of 25, it's like, well, I'm advanced, you know, what else can I gain here? Uh, but they might mm. very well be progressing in the gym at a rate that is, you know, expected of an intermediate, where they see, you know, weekly progressions on the bar, things like this. Uh, so I guess, you know, how do we, in practice, use our metrics in the gym as proxies for our level of advancement, and what rate of progression should we expect to see uh, throughout the time course of our career? Mm-hmm. As a general um, guideline, everything you do, all the estimations, formulas, BMR calculations training advancement calculations, genetic muscular potential. I do all of that with my clients based on their intake form. And that's just the starting point. Mm. So that is the the best possible starting point we can derive based on other population estimates and their individual data. However, as soon as you start collecting actual individual data, which you absolutely should, Mm. strength progression, body composition progression, as soon as you have that, and you also know what someone's energy intake is, assuming you're tracking that, then... Uh, you have much more informative data right there. So if you see, for example, that someone uh, is gaining a lot of weight, uh, probably muscle and also strength, uh, and their their BMR or whatever calculations say you should be at maintenance, evidently they are not. So it doesn't matter what the calculations say. If your fast free mass index index is uh, 29, then it doesn't matter that the supposed max natural max is 25. You are at 29. That's all that matters. Mm-hmm. So... And if you are still building muscle, uh, based on your body composition measurements, especially across a cut and a bulk cycle, you see that you're now at a higher weight at the same caliper measurements, for example, you are still getting bigger. And that's all that matters. So your own individual measurements are always the most important thing ever in terms of any formulaic uh, estimations or whatever. Awesome. And yeah, so, so in the gym, what can somebody who is advanced expect to see in terms of their... Uh, progression in strength. So we, we know, uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion, James Krieger has spoken about this, uh, that probably the best proxy uh, for individuals looking to build muscle is not necessarily their one rep max strength because we have neurological factors that contribute to force production, so on and so forth, mm-hmm. but probably our repetition strength across multiple sets. And I would almost go one further and say that it should be across a micro cycle and a meso cycle where there are similar volumes so we carry a similar level of fatigue and we're seeing that uh, improvement in performance because we know that exposure to tensions are quite an important thing for hypertrophy so mm-hmm. as somebody progresses through their career you know how quickly should they see you know progression in their you know squat for example uh, and when do we know that cool this is where you're starting to reach that advanced level and what are some of the things that we need to consider when trying to determine you know the the metrics in the gym as being uh, indicative that somebody's starting to get to their genetic potential mm-hmm. yeah um, I'm actually a pretty big proponent of one RM strength or at least RM strength so if someone's yeah. like um, basically, the rep target that they have in their training, if they're training at 5RM or 8RM, and if that's getting stronger, mm-hmm. then I think that is a very reasonable uh, proxy to use. Some of that will be neurological, but underneath, there should also be muscle growth. So, a problem with using work capacity is that work capacity is also strongly influenced by gender, for example, and many other factors. And work capacity actually tends to go down as you get stronger. Mm-hmm. So, in some individuals, you can see that their work capacity actually decreases while their 1RM strength and their muscle mass are going up. So the total volume load will also increase, but that by the rest interval and the like. So even though in research it can correlate well with muscle growth, I think in practice it's actually not that useful. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm much more opponent. I do look at work capacity mainly to decide if I think volume can go up or down. Yep. So work capacity pretty much the reps across sets uh, are a measure of neuromuscular fatigue. So if someone's reps go like 12, 6, 3, then there is a lot of neuromuscular mm-hmm. fatigue. Whereas if you go like eight, eight, seven, six, then um, there's not much fatigue. So you should commonly see that with women, they're more likely to be at the eight, eight, seven, mm-hmm. six, and Definitely. men are more like uh, eight, six, four, three. So, um, or three would actually be low, but um, around that level. So I'm, I'm, I think one RM strength for the RM strength you're using is the most practical to use. 
And um, if someone's strength is going up as it should, it should always go up. I think a lot of people are um, probably because they just use suboptimal programs or um, are just no C boat. By you know, I'm advanced, I can't gain strength on a mm. weekly level or session to session basis. I think almost all individuals, and in my experience, my clients gain strength on a workout to workout basis. So you can actually measure from workout to workout, they're getting stronger. At some point you have to implement undulating periodization and it becomes more on a weekly level. So an advanced trainee, it will almost certainly be at the weekly level. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also depends a lot on how long you've been doing an exercise. If you've been, you've had the bench press in your program the last six months, then it's gonna be slow. Yep. Then you're advanced, right? So, but if you are uh, doing the bench press anew, you haven't done it for the last month, then you should definitely be getting stronger at the bench because just of neural adaptations alone. In general, you can also say if, if you're not getting stronger, you're almost certainly not getting bigger mm. because you would expect that neural adaptations are always positive. And if they, the total sum, strength is like the sum of neural and morphological adaptations. So strength is sort of size plus nervous system efficiency. And if you see that uh, the total sum of that is flat, then the neural adaptations should be positive. You're probably actually losing muscle mass. So most people in the diet, especially if you're losing weight and your strength is stagnant, you are actually probably losing muscle mass. So uh, that definitely shouldn't happen until you're at end stage contest prep or you're losing a lot of weight as advanced training. Like if you're bench pressing 150% uh, of body weight uh, or 200% even, and you go from like uh, 220 pounds to uh, 180 pounds, mm. then you're gonna lose bench press strength. There's just, that would be incredible if you didn't. <laughs> but uh, for like most people that stay in the like, you know, 10, 10 20% range of body fat as males, uh, about 20% higher uh, respectively for women, then uh, you really shouldn't uh, see much of a loss in strength until you're really, really advanced. At that point, probably uh, you're, you're making very, very slow process progress. Uh, so I think it is realistic to gain strength quite quite consistently mm -hmm. across a very long time and across many exercises. Uh, All-time PRs in your staple lifts are going to be a bit harder to come by, mm -hmm. uh, but should also occur somewhat regularly. Um, I mean, if you're like, if you it takes you two months to get one rep on your bench press uh, with any given weight, then you're still progressing, but it's it's literally within the margin of error. It could just mm -hmm. be a good day, basically. Yeah. So your rate of progress is so small that. It's actually debatable if you're gaining any muscle, and um, quite probably you're not anymore. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that, that sums it up um, in terms of uh, what's realistic. There's a muscle growth you really can't measure it. So mm. that's, that's a problem. Awesome. So, so this is uh, yeah. There's a lot of things that I sort of want to pick apart there because you raise a lot of really really good points. Um, and the first is I think you know you mentioned that we want to see this progression in strength, um, and I think people automatically think I need to add weight to the bar but for hypertrophy you know strength can also be being able to perform another rep you know uh, being able to perform the same amount of reps at a lower RPE um, you know there's so many ways we can quantify uh, progress and I guess that's really important to note but circling back to what we discussed where I sort of mentioned that I think you know we should be training with similar volumes and assessing these uh, you know repetition uh, PBs and improving our strength. Uh, I guess just to clarify, what I was meaning is that we shouldn't deliberately taper volume down so that we see obviously fatigue drop, performance spike. We should have a consistent level of fatigue present so that we're not essentially peaking when we do test. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, again, this comes down to people, they're very funny. They, you know, if they know they've got a testing day or they're going to be hitting max, they might take an extra one or two days off prior. They might, you know, bring the volumes down a little bit, mm -hmm. the sessions before, and all of a sudden, you know, they express strength as opposed to developing it. And I guess when it comes to hypertrophy, we're not necessarily looking at just improving strength for the sake of it because we want to get bigger. We want to see visual changes. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, Building muscle is so hard to detect um, and determining quantifiable changes in skeletal muscle mass is nearly impossible. So I guess you know, if all these things in the gym are improving and we're getting better, we're getting better, like how, how else do you assess with your clients, Menno, yourself, am I actually getting fucking bigger? Because at the end of the day, you could get as strong as you fucking want, but if you don't look good naked and you're not getting bigger mm -hmm. and getting better and better on the stage, what the fuck does it matter? So I guess, you know, do you want to, do yeah. you want to get into that? Sure. Um, I think in practice, strength is the best you have. Um, body, composition data are, body composition data are 
almost crucial, I'd say. I think that's one of the big things I, I really emphasize. Uh, even if it's just calipers and waist circumference, it doesn't have to be a weekly DEXA scan, which would be nice, but uh, even that has limitations. Uh, but that's more long term, like mm -hmm. on a session to session or week to week basis, the best you have uh, is mostly uh, your strength. And th there are indeed many ways you can progress in strength, but I in practice uh, value almost only extra repetitions or weight on the bar. Yeah. If they're not progressing in either of those, uh, it's just poor progression in my mind. So you can get good at density training, but uh, that problematically there are a lot of adaptations in terms of capillarization, mitochondrial density, that actually make you better at uh, doing a high volume of work in a short period of time without actually increasing the muscle's cross-sectional area. So that's even more confounded than uh, one RM strength or eight RM strength or whatever you're using. I think the best measure is whatever you're training at. As that's getting bigger, you know that under all the same circumstances in the exact rate, your eight RM is increasing. That is uh, the best measure we can hope for to use. Um, and that's most important. Uh, if you're any other progression, like I'm also not a fan generally of people, um, uh, what a lot of clients intuitively want to do is stick with a certain weight when their technique um, sucks or their range of motion has been compromised. And they want to stick with that weight and try to get a bit more range of motion yeah. all the time or something. No. <laughs> it doesn't no. work. It just, no. it, I mean, in theory, it could work. In practice, it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. So in, I'm a very strict proponent of very strict technique. As soon as technique goes down the drain, range of motion is no longer full, weight down all the way. Mm -hmm. If you're supposed to be at 8 RM, those reps simply do not count. It, you don't have half reps. You also see that sometimes, like how many reps did you do? Like one and a half? Yeah. Like that's one. You did one <laughs> yeah, rep, okay? Yeah. Uh, you don't count all the others. If you did eight half reps, that's zero reps. Like period, mm -hmm. absolute zero tolerance policy. It's crucial to have that in your mind. Because uh, if you only if you have that in the back of your mind, especially when you're squatting, you always go all the way down. If you don't have that in your mind, then you're, you cannot measure your rate of progress with any accuracy. Mm -hmm. If you do, technique is sound, always using full range motion training, then your rate of strength development is, I think, the best uh, measure that we have of how big you're actually getting. If you combine that with uh, over long-term body composition data, you see weight is increasing, um, measures of fat, waist circumference and the like are not increasing as much or minimally, then you're probably actually putting on size. Uh, very long-term, I'm actually mm -hmm. also a big fan of clothing. Clothing is actually a pretty good indicator when you really notice uh, fat loss is easier, but muscle growth as well. Like your shorts are getting tinier, your lats are now stuck in your t-shirt. Those are good times. <laughs> that's, that's why I just buy really small t-shirts, man. I, I actually get them smaller and smaller, so people just think that I'm getting bigger and bigger over time. <laughs> it's, it's the best selling point ever. No, but you bring up a lot of good points. I think we need to combine metrics. We need to use both our gym performance, getting stronger you know, in a certain repetition range on certain lifts, most definitely. Um, but what I actually like, and I'd like to you know, hear your opinion on this, is I look at my body composition with a photo at a certain weight. So if I bulk and I get to 88 kilos and I'm pretty fluffy, you know, I can't see visible abs, and then two years later I'm at 88 kilos and I've got a four pack and I'm a, lot, I'm a bit leaner, significantly leaner, that is a really good proxy that I have built muscle. And I think that's really practical and pragmatic. But mm -hmm. a lot of people get caught up in the numbers. They want to know their fat-free mass index. They want to know, uh, you know, they, they get a DEXA scan, all these sorts of things. But those numbers don't actually mean much. As I mentioned, you know, we need to be looking better. So is there something mm -hmm. that uh, you use that's similar to that? Or, is, you know, what are your thoughts on that um, for people out there who just want to like simple and easy way to, you know, measure things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. And photos in general, um, they are crucially dependent on lighting. Mm. Lighting is so, so important. So you really have to get the exact same lighting. Uh, if you're doing it in sunlight, you actually want like the same time of time of year. Uh, <laughs> but otherwise, like bathroom lighting or somewhere where it's only artificial light and you can completely control it. So it's absolutely, absolutely crucial because like even a small difference in lighting can make a huge difference in how you look. Uh, but I, I definitely like that method. Like at the same weight, how do you look? Uh, I often use like what the same caliper readings or at the same waist circumference, how do you look? Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the same principle. So uh, I'm, I'm, I like those a lot as well. It's like a very good uh, approximation because regardless of what all the numbers say, in the end, you want to see it visually. So um, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I like that a lot in terms of very, like very long term, at least six month measurements, like once a year is generally what I uh, like for photos.
Awesome, awesome. And now, you know, we've sort of spoken about the the very uh, surface level ways that we measure progress and, you know, what leads to a stagnation in progress generally. But let's get a little bit more granular. What are the mechanisms physiologically that cause these slowdown in adaptations as we reach our genetic potential? Have at it. Mm -hmm. Sure. So what we want for muscle growth is to put mechanical tension on the muscle fibers. This triggers, triggers mechanotransduction. That um, the disruption of the, the muscle fiber is registered um, as a stimulus, pretty much, uh, for muscle growth. And more physiologically speaking, it is transported to a chemical signal. This activates growth factors like interleukin-6, IGF-1. Um, all of these, these factors together are integrated by mTOR, which is a, an enzyme and a protein. It basically looks at, are there amino acids available in the blood? Is there a mechanical tension on the muscle fibers? Do we have growth factors available? Is this guy on gear? <laughs> all of these things puts it all together, sends a signal to your DNA, your DNA is pretty much the, the blueprint of your body. It's in your myonuclei. Uh, muscle fibers, interestingly, have more than one cell core. Most cells have one. Muscle fibers have lots and lots of cell cores. Um, and, and therein lies the blueprint to actually enlarge the muscle tissue. Uh, so it, you need to basically consult that information to see how you can make it bigger. That information is sent to your ribosomes. They actually encode the proteins. You get muscle protein synthesis. That is the actual process of muscle growth. So there's been a lot of skepticism about muscle protein synthesis as a measure of muscle growth. Mm -hmm. I think we now have very good data showing that if you actually measure the whole process over time, it's a really good measure of muscle growth. It's just if you take a snapshot measure at one time, which is what one famous study found that a lot of people cite this, oh, muscle protein synthesis doesn't mean anything. It means a lot, but if you just look at one time point mm. at the start of a program and then you try to extrapolate that to the next eight weeks of muscle growth, yeah, that's like, you know, you're looking at a computer, you're looking at one chip <laughs> and you're going to see how the motherboard performs. Mm. That, you know, that doesn't matter. But if you have actually all the chips, then you can get a reasonable estimation of how and the motherboard just a si Just a side note on that, I think, you know, for the listeners who are sort of uh, interested in the scientific literature, they need to also recognize that a lot of studies look at total body muscle protein synthesis, uh, when we actually care about myofibular protein synthesis, and there, there is a big difference. And I guess, you know, that's something that those inclined to read papers uh, also need to look at and understand when, you know, trying to make sense of it. Yes, definitely. It's actually, um, uh, our measurement instruments are really not, not precise yet, because there's one study that found there's an elevation in myofibular protein synthesis, but no more elevation in whole muscle protein synthesis, mm. which should be logically impossible, because myofibrillar protein synthesis is a part of total protein synthesis. So if that part is elevated, then the total should also be elevated. Mm -hmm. But apparently our <laughs> measurement instruments are not right. um, precise enough to, to uh, register that. So uh, that's really weird. Um, but in any case, we, we see that there is a dampening of this, this muscle protein synthesis um, over time as you get more advanced. And uh, this has in part to do with um, less muscle damage, also more tra advanced trainees gain experience less muscle damage from a given workout. Mm -hmm. So over time, this reflects in a decrease in muscle growth per session. And um, we see that um, basically you only build a um, tinier and tinier part of muscle growth with each time you train as you get more advanced. Mm -hmm. And at some point, that increase basically becomes net zero and you fit your nanny max. It's actually debatable if that exists. I'm um, not sure if you want to go into that, but... Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's research on uh, gear, on uh, androgenic anabolic steroids, that shows that the uh, myonuclei acquired with that are actually permanent, or like within years, mm -hmm. like within rats, uh, it was like years or something. So in, in human terms, that would be like almost your lifetime. And also in powerlifters, research that um, powerlifters that have been on gear... They had three groups in that study. One group was natty and training. One group was uh, on gear and training. And one group was, unfortunately, a mix. But many of them were no longer training. Um, at least they had used gear in the past. Some were still training. A lot of them weren't. The group that was on gear and training was obviously the biggest. But interestingly, the group that was no longer training, or at least a lot of them weren't, uh, and had used gear in the past, were the same size, or at least the muscle fibers, they did a biopsy, I think, the muscle fibers were still the same size right. as those of the natural trainees that were still pushing it every day, wow. slaving away at the gym. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah. that would suggest that if that group had picked up training, then they should become bigger again, mm -hmm. right? It would be, 
you know, it's possible that they revert to their natty max and they have used so much gear in the past, they were so much bigger that whatever they do, they're going to be at their natty max and it doesn't matter if they train or not. But I find that kind of implausible based on, you know, anecdotally what you see, people that train are bigger than people that don't train. So, um, anecdotally, I've strong. also, I, I've seen similar things, I, you know, and take this for what it's worth, but yeah, I've, I've seen quite a lot of people and worked with a lot of people uh, face-to-face and mostly uh, natural athletes, but I have worked with quite a few people who have you know, previously used and then they come and start training with me. They have a different look about them. You know, they do have the bigger traps. You know, their, mm. their upper chest is just you know, unusually large. Like their backs are just that little bit fuller and thicker. Like they just carry themselves a little bit differently um, you know, and they do look like they've just altered their physique, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, and obviously the, the primary reason is, you know, the steroid use, but even when they come off it, they, they still look like they, you know, have been using it. it it's a, a phenomenal thing to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I fully agree with that. Um, and the nice thing is, so, I mean, it's not just for people on gear. The nice thing is that if we, uh, do, uh, a long bulk, we can actually store more muscle mass on our frame than if we stay lean. Mm-hmm. And now if you combine those two facts that the myonuclei or, you know, there's some retention possibly of uh, a certain level of muscle mass. If you go to your natty max at 10% body fat, you bulk up to like 20%. You now carry an appreciably larger amount of muscle mass, more myonuclei and muscle fibers or whatever is going on. Mm-hmm. You slim back down to 10%. You sh- might be able to retain more of that. Yeah. So, uh, I now have one client actually that's uh, Sigvar Garfors, powerlifting champion in Norway. He's, he's trying this experimentally. Um, I'm not really, I'm not really willing to dream or bulk up to like a really <laughs> fat level. Uh, it's very bad for business, and I don't like it in terms of food choice and everything. Um, but it would be nice um, if that worked. So um, well, inter- uh, interestingly, I have this conversation with a couple of the coaches at JPS. And, you know, in assessing all the great natural bodybuilders, your Alberto Nunes, you know, your Brian Miners, all of these guys, at one point in their career, they did a really dirty bulk. Now, you, mm-hmm. you, it'd be daft to say that that was the sole reason that they got the size that they did and so on and so forth. That's obviously not the case. But if you look historically at pretty much every great natural bodybuilder, They've done a dirty bulk at one point, and myself, I got up to 95 kilos, a very heavy. I'm five foot eight, you know, so a very heavy mm-hmm. 95 kilos, um, and you know, for what it's worth, it's like, well, I built my foundation when I did that bulk, and you know, even when I stripped back, it's like I didn't go back to that skinny kid at like 70 kilos again. Um, mm-hmm. So I think you know, anecdotally, there's definitely you know some evidence there to suggest that this is you know potentially, uh, you know, a hypothesis that might play out in reality. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been, I've tipped hundred kilos a few times, never in the morning. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. So, uh, it's a big you know, don't have pictures, don't have pictures of that much. <laughs> uh, cause you don't, you don't look that good anymore. <laughs> and I've never been, I've never been super fat. Like, you know, I've been at the point where I, you just, if you flex your abs in the right lighting, you still have some abs, yeah, yeah, yeah. but if you, you let go, then it, it's like, especially <laughs> if you have some anterior tilt, you have a bit of a gut. Yeah, and uh, uh, but I'm not really, really really willing to go past that. Uh, but I think if I went like 20 kilos past that, then I would expect I might be able to retain a bit more size mm-hmm. after that. You know, next year. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the the pro- problem is you cannot just bulk up like dirty bulk up to 120 kilos in a month. It has to be accompanied with a lot of muscle growth. So you're actually doing like a proper lean bulk for the next 20 kilos, mm-hmm. uh, and then you have to come all the way back down again. Uh, but in theory, that should elevate your natty max. And uh, as far as we know, um, that might be able to basically keep you getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger indefinitely. I mean, there's there's really no hard evidence that there is such a thing as a natty max, a true mm. maximum. It just gets harder and harder. Yeah. But is there a true maximum? There's, you know, it's often said and anecdotally there, you know, there's somewhat appears to be, but uh, there's really no hard evidence for that. Yeah, I guess this is probably a good time to uh, divert the conversation into what I wanted to discuss quite a bit later, but we'll talk about nutrition now, uh, considering that we're discussing that. Um, So when somebody starts to see that muscle growth is just getting harder and harder and harder, there's a lot of different camps out there in terms of how advanced athletes should approach, uh, you know, their bulking or their muscle gaining phase, whether they should have, you know, a more aggressive surplus where it's like, you know, 20 to 30% above maintenance, except that they're going to gain additional 
additional fat, but that's pretty much, you know, certainly going to mean that they are in a surplus and maximizing their ability to build muscle. The drawback is mm -hmm. that then they have to diet, so on and so forth. But there's other components, you know, on the completely opposite end of the spectrum uh, who say that, you know, you should probably eat at maintenance because gaining fat, um, you know, is going to make it harder when you come to diet for a contest prep. This is assuming that most, you know, advanced athletes are at some point going to be doing a bodybuilding contest prep um, and getting on stage. Um, and, they, and they do think that, you know, the training stimulus is what causes the muscle growth and rightly so. Uh, therefore, we should just make sure that we get enough amino acids, you know, have an isocaloric diet or at least a small surplus and that will be enough to build muscle. So I guess, what are your thoughts on that, Menno? Gotcha. I think... Uh Specifically talking about advanced athletes, the idea of recomposition just doesn't work. Mm. So I'm, I'm basically known for my body recomposition programs, and that's what a lot of my clients come to me. I think probably my specialty would be taking an intermediate uh, athletes to the advanced level. But once you are truly at the advanced level, you're bench pressing 300 pounds plus and the like, then you're just not going to be building any more muscle mass or any appreciable muscle mass in deficit anymore. Um, it will take going into a surplus. And even maintenance is just spinning your wheels. It yeah. gets you nowhere. And I think especially that's a big problem for many women. They never really do a long, proper bulk, so they never really make it to that uh, advanced uh, training status. And they always hoover around like late intermediate. And a lot of guys have this problem as well, but it's mostly because when they bulk, they dream or bulk, and then they gain way too much fat. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, all guys or all masculine guys can eat and lift uh, but it takes a bit more uh, meticulousness and strategy to also be six-pack lean year-round and not get injured in the process and also look good. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people, where they go wrong, especially men, is they, they didn't dream of bulk. They gain too much fat during the bulk. Then they cut too aggressively as well. And they lose a lot of muscle mass. So the, the P ratio, the ratio of muscle to fat gain, is poor both when bulking and cutting. And you end up... Uh, at the exact same body composition, pretty much. <laughs> Spinning your wheels. Yeah. Yo it's, yeah. It, it's basically yo-yo dieting. And, and this is something I've, I've always thought of the bodybuilding community is most of us are just glorified fucking yo-yo dieters. You know, we diet for 12 weeks. We just do it over longer time spans than the average person. The average person does it Monday to Friday, blows out on the weekend. Bodybuilders do it, you mm -hmm. know, 16-week blocks. <laughs> um, you know, but I, I think you're exactly right. And this has definitely been my experience is that, as muscle gain slows down, you need to put all your eggs in one basket and say, I am going to gain. So I guess, do you want to give some some general figures uh, that people should be expecting in terms of how much weight they should be gaining so that they're not you know, uh, biasing that P ratio in, in the wrong direction um, and the duration that mm -hmm. they should probably be bulking for? Because it is hard. People, you know, especially with social media these days, they want to stay lean year round, but the reality is for most people, you know, they're not going to get reliable improvements in performance and good recovery and adaptations if they're six pack lean. They're going to have to get away from that. So, you know, how long should we bulk for? What should we expect to gain on the scale, you know, week to week over the course of a month? Um, and when's mm -hmm. that tipping point where it's like, cool, we've probably overshot things now, time to tidy up and how we go about that. Yeah, so I, I'd probably fall in the, the new camp of lean bulking, as it's called. Because if you look at research on energy balance and muscle growth rates, mm -hmm. we have a couple studies. They're pretty poor. Uh, there's one better one coming up uh, on Brazilian bodybuilders. That's pretty cool. I was invited to peer review, so I had an early awesome. look at the data on that. Um, this showed a bit more advantages to higher surplus. But so far, most research has found that the difference of uh, even being an energy surplus um, or being an energy surplus has a big advantage, at least anecdotally. But once you go into energy surplus, there is very little difference in muscle growth rate and a big difference in fat gain rates mm -hmm. between the different surpluses. And even between like 5 and 10% or even 2 and 5%. And I think the two GARFA studies used like um, 1 versus 5 or something. And the other one was pretty much um, – or the other one was almost maintenance, like it was the, the least possible surplus you could be in and then compared to an already small surplus to begin with. And even then, there was no difference in muscle gain rate. Mm. So I think you quickly get into the spillover point and the best way to go about it is to find that spillover point and stay just at that, at that border. And the reason, the, the way you do that is to um, keep pumping up your calories 
until you're spilling over into fat gain based on your waist measurements, uh, caliper measurements, or whatever you have to measure your body composition. If you see there as fat gain, you're probably tipping, um, tipping over a bit. And of course, there should also be weight gain during this process. And what you want is the highest possible rate of weight gain and ideally also strength gain, but weight is actually more sensitive in this case, mm -hmm. without spilling over into fat gain, or at least not reliably for more than like one week in a row. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the surplus. And problematically, there's actually research on the, uh, the possible growth rate that you can, uh, can get with a given surplus, also from the Garfa studies with a nice graph. And if you compare it across individuals, the graph, it, it looks pretty much like this per individual, which means some people can gain like 1% body weight per week mm. and others gain, are lucky to gain like 0.2% body weight per week, especially advanced trainees. You're probably going to stick with like the 0.2 to 0.5 for most people. Um, and it, it should be pretty linear, unlike fat loss, which is often like stepwise. Uh, bulking should look more linear on the scale. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at a pretty fine but consistent increase in weight and strength that's not spilling over too consistently into into um, into fat gain. I think that way you, you optimize the long-term ratio that you actually build a lot of muscle mass, uh, and like a significant amount, you can measure it, but you're not getting too fat in a process that you have to end up losing uh, that muscle probably when cutting. So I probably lean bulk, and if you do this, then you're gonna be spending by far the most time of the year uh, lean bulking compared to cutting, and that's fortunate. Uh, I mean, it's much, much nicer to lean bulk than to cut. For sure. So I think uh, it's also a, a very sustainable method. Um, but there might be uh, scenarios, especially if you've got an individual that's like super well rested. They now live for the gym or they're on holiday. They don't have a vacation plan. They're just getting their macros in everything, nutrition, cholesterol, omega freeze, sleep, stress, even the stuff that many people think is like the fine details. Mm -hmm. Everything in order, you can probably bump that up to like, 10% surplus, maybe go a bit higher even. That new Brazilian study used about 10% uh, surplus and had a very acceptable uh, P ratio. So, and those awesome. were really advanced uh, trainees. Yeah, so, so it definitely sounds like to me that once you sort of get the nutrition in check and you're just not doing anything stupid, you're eating enough protein, you're in that surplus, not too much of a surplus, you're pretty much going to be in good stead. It's really the training that, you know, is the potent stimulus uh, for protein synthesis and and we know yeah. that. And, you know, this is where I really wanted to center today's discussion was more so on uh, how we need to focus on training for advanced athletes. So we know that periodization is really important in terms of strength athletes, powerlifters, because they have to perform on a specific day um, and we can almost reverse engineer and work back, you know, to that day. Whereas when it comes to muscle game, we don't really have a specific day where we need to perform at our best. You know, bodybuilders have to look their best, not perform their best on stage. That's usually when they're actually performing their worst, but that's a different story. Yeah. So periodization is of less importance, probably a good idea for bodybuilders, but it's just not as important. Um, however, it does become more important uh, for advanced athletes in terms of planning and structuring uh, their training. So, you know, we know that you're a pretty big proponent of, you know, high frequency training uh, for, for advanced athletes. Um, but I mm -hmm. just want to sort of circle back to, to what we said before and what you discussed was that advanced athletes experience less muscle damage. Um, you know, obviously because the repeater back effect is induced and they're just, you know, recovering and adapting pretty quickly. Um, but you also spoke about how my nuclei is really important, um, you know, as part of this model of building muscle and that if we can increase the number of my nuclei, you know, this is my nuclear domain theory, uh, we could potentially increase, you know, satellite cell proliferation and increase our growth potential. And we know that muscle damage causes a lot of, um, you know, satellite cell proliferation and my nuclei go down, donate their cells, all the rest of it. Um, and this comes from damaging training. And I guess my question is, mm -hmm. for advanced athletes, is there a case in doing lower frequency, highly damaging training um, before they then go and do their high frequency training in a periodization, you know, sort of phasic approach? Because then you can capitalize on that new growth potential with more volume in those high frequency phases. It's, I guess, something that I've been thinking about quite a lot and I just wanted to mm -hmm. pick your brain as to how we should best plan this out because we obviously can't train with high frequencies, high volumes all the time. We need to have some structure and mm -hmm. phases to that. Yeah. Yeah, I think we know that muscle damage stimulates a lot of satellite cell activity, mm. but not necessarily that it also uh, stimulates a lot of um, myonuclear addition. So 
the most of the satellite cell activity seems to go towards patching up the damage, mm -hmm. not towards actually building new muscle tissue. Yeah, yeah. So in general, uh, you can say that satellite cell activity is more closely related to the repair of the muscle tissue, but not the increase of the new, um, new actual net muscle growth. So I'm, I'm very skeptical of uh, any, any really direct link for muscle damage and muscle growth uh, in vivo in humans. As opposed to like in in cells, uh, maybe even in, in other animals, uh, uh, but mostly it's mostly cell research that suggests any link um, and the link with the satellite cells. But um, I'm certainly not opposed to it. I've actually tried it myself to induce um, over the last year or so. Sometimes induce like a lot of muscle damage. Uh, it seems to still have gotten me nowhere, but of course that doesn't mean it it can't be useful. Yeah, because uh, a lot of things I experiment with now are like it do, it didn't work. But yeah, nothing else worked either. So, <laughs> yeah, I think um, um, you know it's it's a nice theory, but I, I wouldn't put any stock in it yet mm. in terms of uh, what I do with my clients. Yeah. So in terms of how we then you know periodize our programs, you know, for our advanced lifters, uh, you know, specialization phases become a lot more important. Where we focus on you know specific muscle groups, bringing volume down on you know other muscle groups that we just want to maintain. So we have more adaptive currency to go towards you know that primary muscle group um, you know but how do you think in terms of you know long-term planning of phases do are you very much of the opinion that you know in terms of periodization it's just basic linear you know decrease in reps increasing load sort of rinse and repeat kind of thing do you see any utility uh, you know we obviously discussed the the trying to you know create some damage and you know that whole my nuclear domain theory uh, but maintenance phases where we you know try to resensitize Mike Isratel's really big on this um, you know are there any other ways that you view periodization you know in terms of the strategy that we approach our advanced lifters with mm -hmm. uh, I'm very much uh, my programs are pretty boring when it comes to like the long term yeah. um, kind of programming and that, that, that's, that's usually that's usually what good programs look like <laughs> Yeah, they, they're not, they're not they're so not, sexy. No. <laughs> uh, they, they get the job done. Yeah. But um, uh, they're not necessarily, you know, sometimes I have to switch things up because it's just, just for the sake of variety and stuff. Some people mm -hmm. want that. Most people, though, in my experience, value results above all else. So as long as they get good results, that is most important. Mm. Uh, but in any case, uh, I'm not a big proponent of maintenance phases. I think that's just really spinning your wheels, um, especially for advanced trainees. Resensitization and stuff, I think, is... Um, I mean, research on this is not yet conclusive, but I think it's a uh, misguided interpretation of what really occurs. There is resensitization as part of the process of bustle memory. So basically what happens is that it becomes easier to rebuild the muscle that you lost. And it becomes easy to get back to where you were before, which coincides with a slight period of faster progression. So you, you take one step back, take two steps forward, but you could also have taken two steps forward one step at a time in the process. Yeah. <laughs> and it basically, there isn't a single study that has found any, lo any long-term improvement in results as a result of taking time off. Mm -hmm. The only difference is, are you actually going to lose strength from muscle mass or is it going to be the same? Now, of course, you can make the argument, they got the same results in less time. But, I mean, if you spread it out over long term, first, there's a problem of statistical significance. You know, if they gained a 50 grams less muscle mass, it's not going to detect in a research study like that. So it seems as if they've gotten the same results. But if you take that week off every eight weeks, every year for the next five years, that's a lot of time that you could have spent productively. And then I think it would show. So, you know, it's not definitely not the end of the world if you take a week off sometime. Um, but if, you know, you have a deadline or you want to look your best as possible within one year mm. or you have a show coming up, then you want to use all the time you have. And there is, there is really no plausible mechanism whereby you could gain, you get, get bigger by not training. It's, it's really, in terms of muscle growth, physiologically, it's a very simple process. Uh, I like, really like the quote from uh, my friend uh, Berge Fagerli, strength coach in Norway. He said, muscle is just a dumb piece of meat. It's tissue, it responds to tension, it grows when there is tension, that's it. There isn't any fancy component, it doesn't care about your intentions, it doesn't care if you're using a kettlebell or a machine, it mm -hmm. registers tension. It doesn't matter where you were last year or whatever. It just had a re response to a current physiological state and any stress that is imposed on that state. That's it. So that also, I think, if you conceptualize that in your mind, there is it really defeats the, the purpose of many periodization models mm. that ultimately do a lot of fancy more programming. Tension, more tension over time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That, yeah. If they achieve that, that would be good. Yeah. But so, often they just distribute it differently over time yeah. and get the same end result in the mm -hmm. end. So... 
I like daily undulating periodization. Uh, that has strong research support, especially for strength, muscle growth. Eh, uh, mainly two studies by Brad Schoenfeld's lab uh, that are opposed by like 20 other studies. But, uh, you know, it does, it's not hurtful. Uh, if it benefits strength. It may slightly benefit muscle growth, probably via strength in the long run. May allow you to get higher levels of muscle activation and reach higher levels of mechanical tension on the muscle fibers. Um, there's really no downside, so I like that. Linear periodization for muscle growth, definitely not. Uh, strength, yes. You know, if you're peaking for powerlifting meet, it can be useful. But for bodybuilders, I really see no point. Uh, then any other fancy methods, really, um, I think they're, they're based on the false premise that you need more than just the mechanical tension to begin with. Yeah. So you get like conjugate and what do you do, endurance training and whatnot. And I'm just, I don't do the endurance training. I don't do the nah. speed work. I, do, I, don't do the, I, per, I don't do the power sessions and whatever. So there isn't anything to paradise. It's just mechanical tension, mechanical tension, mechanical tension. Yeah. And, and, and I really like that because that resonates with me and is definitely something that I've seen in practice for my elite level bodybuilders and my advanced physique guys is that once you set up the micro cycle correctly in that you have you know sufficient volume, appropriate intensities, frequencies, exercise selection and then you set in place progression schemes you know according to every exercise and you know their rate of development and what you can expect to see in terms of their progress um, there's not a lot else you need to do you manage fatigue and you keep going mm -hmm. you change exercises and a few variables and what i really like you know that you mentioned was the daily undulating periodization is you know having those lower rep days heavier intensities and those high rep days are, you know lower intensities uh, but higher uh, relative intensities uh, because you get that broad spectrum of rep ranges which we know uh, can be really useful um, we also get you know a broad spectrum of intensities and loading zones which is very useful and it gives people something different to focus on each session which I think can improve the sustainability and for advanced athletes that's usually 99 times the reason people don't become advanced is because they fucking stop training uh, they have a month off and you know they hop programs uh, which is a huge problem so I think anything that you know ticks the boxes of sustainability is a really good thing uh, especially when you're that late intermediate because you just simply need to keep grinding it out uh, to, to become advanced period more tension over time and I'm with you in that you set up the micro cycle you progress it from there and you know you just manage fatigue and you know make sure you don't get hurt along the way but mm -hmm. uh, you know you mentioned Borg for Shirley and something that uh, he's a proponent on is the resensitization uh, week so he doesn't have necessarily a phase but he has a you know, from what I've seen, I could be completely misinterpreting uh, his protocols, but from what I do know, he does advocate having a week off, um, you know, at the end of a mesocycle to resensitize and then starting again. Um, but do you see there to be any benefit from that, uh, you know, from a psychological standpoint, you know, giving people uh, that week off to allow them to make progress long term? Like if we sort of separate the physiology, mm -hmm. even though they're so tightly intertwined, if we just separate for a moment the physiology, it's meat, it just needs more tension to grow versus the psychology and also considering potentially like the joints, uh, integrity and things like this, you know, as we get better and better, stronger and stronger, we lift more weights. Obviously, there's a little bit more wear and tear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, Berger finally... Um moved away from the resensitization um, uh, quite a while ago. He does have some other, uh, propose some other mechanisms that may uh, help. So if you look at, for example, blood flow restriction training or myo reps, they induce uh, about 24 hours after the session, they induce very high amounts of satellite cell activity or certain amounts of, um, I think it was a different type of myogenic cell activity. And then he proposed that it's possible that if you do a day like that in high frequency, uh, type program before like a heavy lifting day then you might be able to get more myonuclear addition or more muscle growth um, but plausible uh, but no research to support it yet and I think it's just um, the, the time course of what you do with one session and a different uh, session that you do afterwards they're going to have two different adaptations and those are going to just uh, concur at the same time they won't overlap so it's not like uh, your your body forgets what the activity of a certain process is. Like, oh, we have blood flow to this muscle group um, because of the last training session. Now we have this blood flow, but we're going to train a new muscle group, so we're going to direct all the blood there. No, it's still going to direct the, the blood to the biceps because the biceps were strained. It's not going to yeah. use it for the quads, for example. So, uh, possible. I'm not sure if he still uses that. I think he's more of a proponent now of lower volumes and uh, possibly deload tweaks. Um, yeah. because of his current clientele, which are more um, 
sustainable interested focus. in yeah very sustainable very much um, CEOs and the like that are interested basically in um, don't want to formulate it too uh, too bluntly but like to uh, get the the minimal amount of effort and still good results pretty much okay. so um, or find a, a good lifestyle compromise however you define it um, but on that note if um, I think for a lot of other people that are more serious and like training um, I think a deload week is actually can be detrimental in terms of motivation. Mm. But for me personally, I actually noticed that it's it's harder to get back in the gym if I haven't been in a while. You sort of get into this routine without it. Whereas if I go every day, I don't even think about it. It's just part of my routine and I just go. So I've noticed that for a lot of people also um, a quite noticeable difference in motivation between six and seven sessions a week. People that do seven sessions a week, it's like they never miss a workout mm. uh, if they can help it. But with six workouts, there is always that, oh, I have the rest day. You move the rest day. Oh, something else happens on the other day. You get a double rest day. So, you know, it's definitely not the end of the world. But over time, uh, yeah. it can add up to a yeah. small difference. Um, then there is the deload consideration for connective tissue. Uh, I've debated this with Mike Isfratel a lot. Um, I think there is there's certainly... Uh, merit to it and that it can help to preemptively just take a week off to make sure that um, you recover from damage that is not manifest yet so you know there's a certain level of degeneration of tendons for example that is occurring at a cellular level but you don't experience yet as pain it doesn't trigger uh, the pain receptors yet so uh, it can make sense if you can predict this somehow to take the week off preemptively and make sure that that damage also dissipates Problematically, you cannot really predict it. Um, for me, it doesn't make sense if you um, to do this at the whole body level. For example, mo most people have strong and weak joints. If you know that someone has weak elbows, and the only way you're going to really know that is for one from the frame size is a good estimate, but really you just experience it. They get elbow injuries and the like, or aches, small stuff um, that if you manage it well doesn't lead to a full blown injury. And uh, over time, you see that someone has weaker joints, and then maybe you ease up on those joints for certain periods, but there are ways to work around that. It doesn't have to require taking a week mm. off. And if you notice that you're getting an elbow injury, there's no reason to stop hip thrusting. Yeah. So I think it should be joint specific and it should be uh, worked around if possible. So go higher in reps, slow down the tempo, uh, implement blood flow restriction training, mm -hmm. uh, myo reps. You can have many different techniques that are extremely joint friendly and still allow you to get that training stimulus in without hurting the joints. So I'm more of a proponent of whenever possible work around the injuries and leave full rest as a last resort. Um, probably last but not least because full rest actually doesn't recover your joints well at all. Tendons are really, really poorly um, supplied with blood. Blood flow perfusion in tendons is, is minimal and there's a, about a seven-fold difference with exercise. So a lot of people um, have experienced that squats, for example, are like a whole body healing exercise. Yeah. It's, it's really true. <laughs> yeah. It's like whenever you have like small aches or whatever in your elbows and after a squat workout, it's, it's gone. I've had a lot of clients uh, experience that where they've had knee injuries um, and mm -hmm. like, you know, just persistent pain in their knees and really like poor hip uh, structure they feel like just constant pain in their hips and then you know you get them squatting and then all of a sudden it's like well the pain's gone <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah know? as long as they can do it pain tendon, free then yeah tendon that's... loading is really important yeah yeah absolutely so i think um uh keeping the training in there is, is whenever possible the way to go so again i mean it's not the end of the world if you miss a week of training um on the other hand i think Many people underestimate, they overestimate how much muscle they lose, mm. but they underestimate how much fat they gain. Because if you keep eating like you normally do, which a lot of people do, then you're going to gain quite a bit of fat. And in some people, this, this can amount to like a pound or two pounds, and that is going to require them two, three weeks of cutting. And then you lose not one week, but actually three weeks of progress, because once you're advanced, Time spent cutting is not time spent growing. So then you're four weeks behind. And if you do that every eight weeks over the next 10 years, <laughs> then, you know, it's actually going to be a big difference. Yeah. It's, it's really all about planning things out and not doing anything too extreme, I guess, you know, for the advanced lifter. It's just a consistency, getting that exposure to tension. And I, I do very much agree with you. I was probably in the opposite uh, camp to what you are now. Uh, many years ago, in terms of deloads, it was like, well, you have to manage fatigue. If you're, you know, generating fatigue, you got to manage it, and you got to take a deload. Like, you know, you have to do it. But I realize that's again more so important from a planning standpoint for power lifters, where and strength athletes, where on a specific day you need to perform. So we're really trying to tightly manage fitness and fatigue. But for bodybuilders, 
we are accumulating fatigue because we're training with higher volumes and we need that con constant exposure to tension. Therefore, we don't want to get rid of that just because. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I very much agree that you know the deloads are uh, probably overstated for physique athletes and if you can find other ways to just you know manage uh, the joint stress and things like that, then, then go for it. And finally, Menno, I want to talk about the recent 45-set uh, study uh, that caused an absolute uproar. Uh, we mm -hmm. probably should have opened with this because we would have got a lot of people's attention and everyone would have sat there with their popcorn and ready to go. Um, but if people have made it this far, I'm sure they're going to be in for a treat. Um, so... We saw a recent publication from Schoenfeld come out that showed uh, you know, significant hypertrophy occurring up to 45 sets uh, per week and then there was some serious backlash uh, from a number of individuals specifically and most notably Lyle McDonald uh, really wasn't happy with uh, the statistics that were run by James Krieger and you know, some of the conclusions that Schoenfeld came to and all the rest of it. And it's been uh, quite a debacle in the evidence-based community between uh, Alan Aragon and, and this. It's just a uh, very interesting mm -hmm. time. So I guess, uh, yeah. what, do you, what do you make of uh, the 45 set study? What You're a man who, in my opinion, is, is very much about the data, not people's feelings and you know being friends with people you've always sort of you know run your own mm -hmm. course and had your own opinion and are willing to you know stand out and be an individual amongst you know the movement and community that that we see uh so i really do value what you have to say on this and i'd love to hear yeah your thoughts mm -hmm. yeah i think the, um, a lot of people uh often i often say the quote that if you're just looking at one study and not the literature as a whole. It's like skipping to the end of the book and complaining you don't get the ending. That's what I used you to have do in high school, at, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, but then, you, then at least you read the cliff notes or something. Yeah. So at least you should read the introduction of that paper that you're critiquing to see what the previous research is. And in this case, uh, it's actually a replication study. So a lot of people are like, whoa, this is a shocking new study. No, actually, these results are just a replication of stuff that has been found about uh, I think it was 2011, yeah, something like that, or uh, the Radeli study in any case. Um, so that study was, it's pretty much the same, also up to 45 sets per week, dose response, actually much stronger dose response. The uh, the effect sizes there of the 45 sets group for the triceps were off the chart. Um, so I'm in the process of conducting a meta-analysis on training volume, uh, and I actually saw um, yesterday or something that uh, James Krieger beat me to it with the analysis result. Uh, finding the same thing, uh, but the data are, are quite clear in terms of the literature as a whole. Also, the new hard grief study that came out just shortly after this, and many people are like, we use that as a, the refu refutation because it seemingly found an optimum at about 20 sets mm. per muscle group per week, uh, with higher volumes being detrimental. Um, but it wasn't any in terms of statistical significance. So, just looking at one study like that, and I think that the methodology that Brad used uh, and Law McDonald's claims of his critique. Um, are, are valid, but they also apply to a lot of other studies. Mm. So, and I think Law McDonald's allegations of, well, I think he never outright said that Schoenfeld manipulated data, but he did con at first accuse him he of alluded uh, to that, yeah, yeah, conscious, um, intentionally uh, deceiving or uh, misrepresenting data, and um, saying like, how can you have so many publications per year and uh, the like? Um, I think that is just because. Brad Schoenfeld's name is on a lot of publications, but that doesn't mean he was actually involved in the study. Um, or, you know, they just asked him to provide his input. Yeah. And once you're in a, his prominent position like that... It, it's just like a uh, stamp. A people, people just want yeah, the stamp. It's, yeah, yeah, it's like being featured on an album. Yeah. It's like, you know, there's a... Um, you, you did the chorus in one of the songs, not to d devalue his input or anything, you know, but uh, it's just the, the amount of publications he has done. There is no way that he, he does all of that work himself. It's mostly uh, reviewing. He was involved with the design. Um, so that, that I think that's not a fair uh, critique of Law McDonald to say that his work cannot be legit because of that. Um, and I think uh, in terms of his, his other claims, um, yeah, they're just... Um, Restricted to that study, and if you apply that critique to everything else, um, which he doesn't, then um, you're left with very few data to begin with. Mm. And I think it's most important to just 
not see what that study found, but also combine it with the previous study, Radeli et al., also the new Hargreaves study, and also the 40 other studies that we have that came before this. And if you do that, if you look at meta-analysis results, uh, and very importantly, you differentiate between untrained and trained individuals, you actually get a very clear trend in the literature. And interestingly, I just, I just finished this morning the uh, calculation of the means uh, with different uh, groups, like per five sets volume. There are no diminishing returns in the data as a whole right. in meta-analysis. In trained individuals specifically, up to at least 20 sets per week. And um, now actually up to 45. But that is skewed up by a few very high effect sizes mm -hmm. from Schoenfeld and especially the Radeli study. Because people critique Schoenfeld's effect sizes, but Radeli study's effect sizes were actually bigger. So um, it's it's not it's not new and it's not out there. It's really is is data fits quite well in the whole pattern of the literature. So I think they are legit for sure, and um, the the whole uh, literature as a whole. Uh, points a very clear path in that more volume is better as long as you can recover from it because there are also a few studies that find detrimental effects of more volume. And probably the difference there is like Mike Isratel's concept of maximum recoverable volume. More volume is better if you can still recover from it. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get into considerations like street, uh, stress, sleep, are they bulking or cutting? Because you know most literature has people just hoovering around maintenance. In Hargreaves study, for example, uh, people were saying, look, this study was also in trained individuals. Uh, their cap was like 20 sets per week. But look at their protein intakes. It was like 1.6 plus minus 0.9. Mm. So some people were like way inadequate in protein intake. Uh, based on those data, some people were just woefully inadequate for a sedentary person, let alone a strength trainee. So I think uh, that was probably the reason that those guys uh, made relatively poor results or couldn't handle the extra training volume, whereas those in uh, Schoenfeld study uh, they're better, although if you look at their nutritional log there, they're not optimal either. Um, also, claims of uh, steroid use, which I've also heard. Radeli's study was on uh, Navy personnel, which I think were actually on like an aircraft carrier in the water. So <laughs> it's possible they smuggled stuff in there, but they also weren't resistance trained to begin with. Uh, however, they were trained. They did like military training, calisthenics. Yeah. Yeah. I count that as trained. Some people say they were untrained because they were not strength trained. But military personnel is definitely not untrained. Mm. I mean, the, the training they do, they do. If you can do 10 pull-ups, you are not untrained. Yeah. It's it's basically, it's that simple for me, for the upper body at least. And um, it, you, you basically get the perspective of someone that doesn't do intentional strength training, goes on an aircraft carrier, risks his career and everything but wasn't willing to do strength training to begin with, smuggles steroids on board the ship and yeah, then exactly. uses them during a scientific study. That's like way out there, conspiracy <laughs> theory. So, Can you imagine uh, smuggling steroids on to do your uh, burpees in the morning and your bear crawls yeah. you know, as part of your training? <laughs> that doesn't make a lot of sense at all. But no, Menno, no. that was, um, yeah, I guess a very good recap and assessment of the situation and the, the literature at a whole. And I, I guess that's really important for listeners to remember is that one paper doesn't completely overhaul, you know, the direction that all of the literature, you know, is pointing towards when it comes to, you know, hypertrophy. And in particular, this study didn't even do that. Um, you know, there's just been a lot of backlash about the methodologies. And this is why you guys as listeners need to be scientifically literate and, you know, pay attention to uh, learning how to interpret and digest scientific uh, discourse so that you can be more critical and, you know, sharpen your thinking skills when you're, you know, getting this information uh, passed on to you. But Menno, thank you very much for coming on, man. I really appreciate you taking uh, the time out to speak to everyone on Advanced Hypertrophy today all the way from Bali. Uh, where can the guys find you? Uh, you, you you've changed, you've changed, yeah, you've changed your website yeah. name. It's no longer Bayesian yeah, Bodybuilding. Yeah, yeah. So I thought I better uh, exactly. yeah bring that up. So go for it. Yeah, menowensimons.com. My Facebook is now also menowensimons. They don't redirect anything, unfortunately. My website should redirect in a few days once the tech team has uh, worked out a couple issues. You would think these days it's easy to de design a website. Apparently it's not. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, there are still some bugs, but metalensimals.com has everything. Um, I'm on Twitter, uh, not not very actively, mostly active on Facebook and Instagram. So you can follow me there if you're interested. And uh, keep in touch. Awesome. Meno, thank you very much, man. My pleasure.